Hi there. Hi there, and Happy New Year. Can we still say that? I know that's a Larry David joke. Uh, you've, you've, uh, you've, no, just kidding. <laughs> well, so There's a whole thing on Curb Your Enthusiasm. If you watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, Larry David, he has this whole thing, whole spiel where he's like, no, you, you're too late. Like, I, I think three days after, ha- after New Year's is the last time you can say Happy New Year to someone. After that, you're too late. Not, not here because not here. it is really just the beginning of winter because yeah. winter starts December 21st or 22nd yeah or started because we are recording this on December what 19th. Day did you say? 19th yes 2021 2021 but and it will be 2022 when you hear it or see it this is Silhouette's JB podcast hello everybody I am Gia it's JB podcast thank you Nick and Desi Dramard yes and what's comments. your name my oh right <laughs> my name is Devi. Where did that come from? <laughs> Wrong show. This is, this is in Oklahoma. Uh, well, it's you know when they're playing to to the guy with no nose. You know they're in uh, the the mm-hmm. place where you fly over to get to L.A. Yes. So it's in like it's some of sort of one of those. You know. I like being in that niche. Yeah, can, can exactly. This is the niche. That's yes. where we are. So I'm the V. So. Okay. Well, we're also going somewhere where you have to fly several thousand. Fly miles down under. To. Correct, because today we are continuing our final diversification in yeah, um in, in, in different guests that we have into on our the show. international worlds yes. of Jersey boys. Exactly. And we are going <laughs> to Australia today. Ooh, and la, our Zoom, la, Zoom, call. Zoom studio yes. in Australia. It's our first, it's our first interview with any creative in Australia. We're so excited. Yeah. We got Thomas Armstrong Robley in the Zoom studio, who is not only playing Tommy DeVito in Jersey Boys at the star on the Gold Coast in Australia, but he is also directing this production of Jersey Boys. And this is the second production of Jersey Boys he has done. Um, and he'll tell us more about the first time he did it when he comes on. Yes, and he's already accomplished so much too, because if you have to go on their Instagram, it's just called Jersey Boys Musical. And they have had one-on-one interviews um, with each season. So for example, Thomas is playing Tommy. Get it, Tom, Tom, Tom. very cool. Hey Tom. Hey Tom, you hungry? hungry? They started with, Daniel Reichard, who um, was interviewed by um, the gentleman playing uh, Bob Gaudio in that production. Then they did, and then John Lloyd Young. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, no, I and think then, first it was John, then Daniel. And then just recently, then Christian. Thomas interviewed Christian. Yes. And now tomorrow. Um, With they're, our friend, they're, J. Robert Spencer. Yeah, and their Nikki will be interviewing J. Robert Spencer. It's going to be Yeah, so and that is the cool. first time that all four of the original like four seasons from the show have actually participated in some interview process for another. Yeah, gig, like, in, like close so proximity, cool. you know. Yeah. And so Thomas was actually born in England and he grew up in Australia. And Thomas trained at the Queensland Conservatorium of Music. He has performed in leading roles in shows such as The Phantom of the Opera, where he was the Phantom alternate and understudied Raoul. He was Kanicki in Greece. Woo! He was Roger in Rent, and most so recently, cool. the Pirate King in Gilbert and Sullivan's The Pirates of Penzance. And he has performed with orchestras and pops orchestras all over the AU. It's the coolest thing when you just perform with an orchestra. That's that's like one of the coolest things. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's a dream for sure. And um, so well, I'm really excited to really delve into his directorial work. And he has directed Into the Woods, Cinderella, The Pantomime. I have no idea what that is, but I can't wait to talk about that with him. Um, he directed Greece as well, and Pirates of Penzance was really Vaz. Pirates of Penzance. What did I say? Pirates of the Penzance. Of the Penzance? Pirates I, I, of Penzance. I always say it wrong. I don't <laughs> no, know why. I'm so sorry. Okay. And um, he also earned 20, 20 awards. That's for incredible. Like a Metaphor. Mm-hmm. The production of Like a Metaphor for the 2015-2016 Queensland Drama Festival circuit, including a nomination for Best Director. Congratulations. Yes. And what we think is one of the coolest things about Thomas is that he developed not one not, not two. two, not three, but five concert cabaret shows. And one of them, of course, is a all around Frankie concert. So it's called Live, Live at Frankie's, the songs of Valley and Sinatra. And, and his concerts span over different genres of music. So you have classic rock, you have different stage and film music, you have soul, Motown and disco. So he's all over the map, just like we are. And, and we love it. So we're really excited to talk about somebody who has that mind who kind of spans different decades and we just can't wait to talk about everything with him and really get his perspective from australia so please without further ado welcome thomas armstrong Armstrong robley welcome what's going on guys there we are welcome to australia welcome we are happy to be down under 
Um, so before we go any further, can you please tell us the names of the gentlemen who will be playing the other seasons along with side with you in Jersey Boys? Um, so we, I mean, we have an amazing cast. Like uh, I think all four of us were overseas when, when COVID hit. And so we've all come home. Um, so this is now home for us. So playing Frankie Valley um, is Bryn Jenke. Um, now Bryn actually just won an award for portraying Frankie Valley in another production. So he is now uh, insisted no, yeah, that I call him the <laughs> award winning Bryn Jenke at all times. Um, so, <laughs> Very nice. so he'll walk into a rehearsal with a coffee, you know, first thing in the morning and you'll go, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the award winning Bryn Jenke. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we have Jack Saunders, um, who's an amazing multi-talented musician, a triathlete and singer he plays oh, wow. um he plays bob gordio and then believe it or not the guy that was sitting in london with me when COVID hit um you know we were drinking cider in regent's park wondering what was next for us um called elliot baker he's an amazing um he's a comedian he's got the most gorgeous baritone voice and um comes from a long line of classical singers and and he's playing nick Ooh, i wonder how he's gonna do the towels oh yeah I'm very you curious. know it's gonna yeah. <laughs> that's that's like it's such a i think that and i we'd love to talk about that moment with you as a director as, as well as, as an actor you know what yeah. you know further on in the interview we'd love to talk to you about that but that 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 monologue is just so just so dr dramatically comedic you know yeah. it's fantastic <laughs> Yeah, it's fantastic. So we, we'll definitely yeah. get into that later on. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're glad that you're back home in Australia. So, so you were in London the whole time. I was until... I was believe it or not, when when co I, I left Australia uh, surprisingly late in what was it? 2020. No, where are we? 2020. So I, I actually had left um, Australia in in 2020 to join Norwegian Spirit for what I believed was going to be three weeks um three weeks turned into two months at sea um and then you know i thought from there it would be a case of fly back to australia unfortunately there was no safe routes for me to fly back to australia um because you know it would it would mean going through five or six different airports which in the midst of this huge pandemic and we didn't know anything about it at the time so it, it was it just wasn't safe so fortunately i'm, I'm a uk citizen as well so i just went Great. back to England thinking, you know, a couple of months back to work. Um, that didn't happen. Eight months later, I was I was still sitting in, in London twiddling my thumbs and, and, you know, some good stuff happened like a podcast, things like that. But for the most part, I was still very much wondering when am I going to get back on stage? Um, what, what do I do? Well, thank God for that podcast pivot because none of us would be talking right now. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Well, please continue to stay safe. Um, well, so for everybody listening to this, like we are recording this in late December, December 19th, and things are really crazy right now in New York City. Um, Jersey Boys actually canceled their performances this weekend on the 18th and 19th. Yeah. So we're praying that everything's going to be okay. And of course, for your show, which is January 6th through the 16th, that all is smooth and under control so we're wishing you all the best yeah. you can't keep that you can't hold the jersey boys down you cannot no, so never. you cannot stop us we will be on that stage i promise you <laughs> I salute. I salute. yes I salute. so well, we'd love to get to know a little bit more about you so your early years as we like to call it so you were born in uh -huh. england and so please tell us how, how, what was it like how you grew up and when did you catch the music and the theater book so uh I, yeah I, I was in england till i was I think I moved to Australia at the age of eight. So, you know, very early years was, was England. Page one to 43, I think we'll call it. <laughs> true going by the script. Um, no, so little yeah. Jersey boys humor for you there. Um, <laughs> um, no, so I, I grew up there and, and, you know, I was still very much in the, it was just primary school and things like that. So I didn't, I did one show in the UK as a, as a kid. And I think I was pushed into that drama class as a way of, you know, I was a kid that liked to dress up, you know, I, I would take a, a black bin bag or a bin liner or try, I don't know if you guys put the bit. A trash bins. bag. Trash bag. Yeah. yeah. And I would, I would cut a hole in the neck and then put a pair of boots on with it and oh, I'm a musketeer or whatever. That's um, it. That's so that it. was that kind of kid. So I think my mom saw that and pushed me into drama class as a kind of way of shifting some of that creative energy. I, I wasn't really engaged with it. Um, and, and I think even in the early years of me getting to Australia in 2002, I was doing drama, but I was very much the sports kid. And it didn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't until high school when I kind of faced that 
high school musical esque crossroads where I, you know, you go. I, I had, I had, and, and this is a true story. I had the grand final of my, of my soccer. Um, I was the captain of the team and I was the goalkeeper. So pretty important. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I, I also had so. the, I also had the final dress rehearsal of, uh, of the first musical I was playing a lead in, which was the Wiz. And, Ooh, nice. um, and I had to choose and mm-hmm. I chose musical theater and that that is kind of how it ended how it ended up so yeah wow wow all right Trey Bolton (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) wow that's well isn't crazy those defining moments that you have in life and that's that was we talk about a lot with Jersey Boys of course you know because I feel like for us like high school musical was definitely my introduction to everything dance musical theater film the whole thing that was in also in 2006 the year Jersey Boys won the Tony so that's full circle. Um, but the whole show is about those defining moments. And you know, the older we get and the more of those moments that we have, everything really can be broken down into one scene or one line or one movement of blocking in Jersey Boys. So when you first um, you know, watch the show, like what, what things in your life were you going through and what things kind of came to mind? So I was freshly 18 when I first saw Jersey Boys. I saw Jersey Boys july of 2012 um it was john lloyd young's first night back up for he was coming back for eight weeks um and i had no idea what the show was about i mean i'd grown up as i said in england so bye bye baby which was one of the few songs that i really recognized was a bay city rollers hit um right. for me that was their it was their song it wasn't the four seasons um i'd heard begging through you know um different you know versions of that and same with oh what a night i was familiar with the disco arrangement of it but not the not necessarily the four seasons and i just remember going into the show um and being so blown away with how much of the repertoire i actually knew and you know and, and, you know you immediately become a fan it's, it's impossible not to because you you're being educated through this um um through this amazing, amazing show. And I remember, you know, looking back now, not, I'm not appreciating at the time the, the talent that I saw on that stage, like, as I said, John, and but also Andy Carl as Tommy, mm-hmm. you know, like, wow, what a cast. Um, I remember it was so funny and, and we were talking about the towel sequence a second ago. I remember there was a line dropped and I remember being aware enough that something had dropped. And I don't think anyone in the audience would have, but I think because I'd done quite a few like community musicals up to that point, I was aware enough that I could notice when a line was dropped. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't remember, again, I can't remember off the top of my head who was playing um, Nick. So obviously- It was Matt, and I it don't was even Matt know, Bogart. Yeah, and I don't even know if it, was, if it was his line, but I just remember there being a moment of something's gone wrong here. But then eventually the show, the show rolled on and I was probably the only one out of, you know, however many, seats that the August Wilson Theatre held that probably noticed but yeah it's it's fascinating that I still remember that moment after all these years. Wow no absolutely I know it's definitely one of those um, like Disney collectible moments as we talk about yeah because every show is a different story every production is different um, but okay so you were 18 when you saw it you're only about two and a half years older than we are and you've yeah. been crazy busy so I love that you've been creating like different concerts and cabarets um, like for yourself and for you know your your colleagues um, but how have you had the time to go through all of that plus your other productions? Because at least in the States, it's it's very rare for us to be able to do all of those things before 28. It's interesting. Um, I, I guess like I, I kind of when I, I so I studied from 2014 to 2016 at the, at the conservatorium. And I think, you know, for me, day one at the con was the day that I started looking for work after the con, if that makes any sense. Yeah, of course. So I think, whereas I think a lot of people that I know started a way that you wait till third year and then you think, okay, what now? I was thinking what now before I even, you know, stepped through the doors at the, at the university, because at the end of the day, it was more about, it's always about, you know, how do I become the most employable, the most valuable artist I possibly can be. And I think I've always been a person that, you know, never I won't take no for an answer when it comes to you know my work I, I if, if there's no work for me which in Australia a lot of the time there is no work for you because there's there is I suppose a lack of 
big touring productions. We don't have tour national tours of you know every musical that's on Broadway. We we have maybe we have so limited in terms of the amount of theaters that go around, and also we don't have what I would call a a revolving door audience because mm-hmm. no one is coming to Australia necessarily just for destination theater. You wouldn't travel to Queensland just to see a musical. Now the odd person might, but certainly not enough to maintain a show for years and years and years and years and years. Um, so for me, the writing was on the wall that, you know, I was going to have to create my own work to sustain me. Um, and, you know, looking at things like cruise ships and, you know, I was, I was always, as much as I love musical theater, I knew that the way to back to musical theater was going to be through establishing myself as a solo and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and try to create concepts that made me really attractive to, you know, cruise lines, to agents, to theaters that could, you know, you know, really pay my bills. And then through the reputation I would gain because of that, you know, because of, you know, you go overseas, you work and you do these concerts, you become, you can then credit yourself as an international concert artist, which is, you know, and then immediately you're more valuable back in, back in Australia. So, it wasn't necessarily that I necessarily wanted to leave Australia and, you know, and, and make a living elsewhere. It felt like a necessity, if that makes sense, to, to just kind of, of to make it happen. And I suppose like the seasons, it, it's, it's, you're not defined by how much talent you have. You know, I've been very upfront with, with everybody I talk to. I don't consider myself the most talented guy in the world. There's people that can sing high notes. There's people that can dance better steps. There's people that can take that guitar off the wall and do something like a prodigy with it. I, I, I'm not that guy, but I'll work harder than anybody and, uh, mm-hmm. and make it happen, which is, I think, why I relate to Tommy so much, which we'll get into later, because he was that guy too. Yeah, of course. So, well, I, I love that story. And we, I think it's so inspiring that you really do hit the ground running all the time. And you're always, you're always learning and studying, especially with the range of music that you've worked on. Um, so mm-hmm. we heard, we were watching your interview with Christian Hoff. Congratulations on that awesome achievement, by the way. Did, um, I just want to say right up front, we did not plan to wear hats. Like we just turned I was going to ask you that. Yeah. And we looked so in sync. And I was like, this is so spooky but what i mean what Meant a cool guy yeah, he, he is the coolest he's really cool yes and, and that means that you're doing heart. something right yeah yeah no he is yeah so we've actually we've had the pleasure of, of meeting christian hoff um through our associate producer howard tucker and yeah so we met about a show and he's he's the sweetest the guy sweetheart yeah always wearing a hat yep are you, all, that are night you too? always wearing a hat it's funny this this hat actually has a oh that's real flat um <laughs> this hat actually has a story so i, I did a um I used to teach three, three kids, three brothers, um, 17, well, I mean, they get older now, but they, they're about a year apart, each of them. And um, I, I've done a number of, I'm heavily connected with a, with a local theatre company here that runs a performance academy for young kids. And that was where kind of I got my start. So I always keep my toe dipped in there because, you know, I'm very thankful to them for, for everything they've done for me in my early years. Um, anyway, these, this hat was a gift. Um, I... I was asked to come and lead the company of School of Rock um, um, earlier in the year. So I, I was kind of brought in as a professional artist to work with, you know, with community kids and, and uh, which was an amazing role, hell of a hard role. But you played the, Dewey? I played Dewey, yeah, nice. um, which was the hardest role it's that I've ever played on stage. Really? It's a killer. It's a killer. And we were doing like tech week. I did nine runs of the show, which is great. Like, yeah, yeah, it was nuts. Like much more intense than the Broadway schedule, <laughs> like, because the seasons are so packed. Um, uh, but anyway, this, this hat was mm-hmm. a gift from the family um, who I I dubbed on stage. Um, they're called the Van Stams, and and on stage in a concert years ago, um, these kids were doing a cabaret, and I I introduced them as the three members of the Van Stam gang. And Aww. that little joke, that little joke has kind of become an, an opening, uh, opening night of the show. They handed me this bag and said, you're now an honorary member of the Van Stam gang. And um, because they all wear this kind of hat as well. So I, um, it, it, it's, it's got a meaning behind it and it just looks cool as hell. There you go. Yeah. Well, what a stylish gang. That's so fun. Yeah, absolutely. 
a, 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 cr a crazy story about School of Rock. Um, Alex Alex Brightman, who originated the role on Broadway, said Incredible. he Saw couldn't. Him. Yeah, wow. <laughs> insane, insane. He said he couldn't take a nap in between shows on a two show day because it would take him like four hours to warm, warm up. up. Mm -hmm. Wow. I used to get up and you can, and you can, you can, you can ask my partner about this. Um, yeah. I used to do the same. I would have to get up. I, I used to get up four to five hours. I get up three hours before I sing anyway, but four, four hours before the show, I would go for probably a five to 10 kilometer walk. Um, I would just like naturally, you know, have to just, there'd be a regiment in my dressing room. I would have mm -hmm. uh, this bottle, which is a, a liter and a half. Um, I'd have one of these filled with water. I'd have, Another one with two Barocca, two Hydrolite. Oh, wow. Just in Act One, just to replace the, the, the fluid you lose. I'd have lozenges already unwrapped, ready to go, because you're never off stage in that of first act. Like, and then even in Act Two, um, it's just, it's one of the most, it's, it's the most testing role I've ever had. I was at the physio every week, you know, not because I was injured, just for maintenance, you know, it was Did just, you know? and it was just, and, and the whole cast really, they put you on your sh their shoulders and they they help you through it like i've never That's felt cool. love from a cast before like that i would have a, i would have the i had such a, a regiment like a military regiment like i'd have a banana between each in it uh, in, <laughs> yeah. the middle of, in the middle of act one and act two that was just like to keep my energy Interval. levels up i'd have mm -hmm. to eat sad eat the same meal before every show I'd, I'd meal prep the same thing so like you just become it just becomes science you know and, and yeah. how, how you know in, you know what's going to get you through it in in jersey boys in the dodgers productions they have very specifically and strategically placed water bottles and fluids for for frankie mm -hmm. to be able to drink on stage yeah so mm -hmm. i it, when i i i saw you posted on your instagram that you went to go see the toxic avenger in the west end um, a few years back, I, I, I played Melvin a few years ago. Um, also, definitely the hardest role I've ever had to play. Um, I, I had like five water bottles placed at different parts of the set. I also did a lot of the same things that you had to do for, for Dewey. I did for Melvin. It was just, it, it's, it's, but when you actually do it, and then when you take your bow and curtain call and you see not only the audience, you hear the, the roar from it, but you see everyone around you, you feel that love from them. It's just like, wow, I did that. And I have this amazing cast, amazing support system. I think the kids helped as well, big time. Like, like you are on stage there and obviously in the first act, a bit of a bad boy and stuff like that, but you are like, you're a God to these kids. Like you're, mm -hmm. you're a hero Seriously. and like, and it's, they really they i don't think they understood how much they got me through it like they they probably looked at me and were like wow we couldn't do the show without you but i i honestly could not have done that show without them like they they literally gave me the life to to get through it because it was just so it's such a slog it's like every song has the bottom is like the bottom of your high notes are like g's and then it's up to c's in some numbers it's, it's crazy where where is your it's so funny we i, I asked these, i asked this question to a lot of people but um not really a lot of people to to no to select few people i've asked this question yeah. to where is your passaggio you would say your uh i would say i mean it depends it depends show to show if it's a it's a rock show it's one thing if it's if it's okay uh, if it's a legit show it's another thing i where look i'll i'll say this every show i do and it and it's changed. It's funny because after years of, of ships, my passaggio has changed. Um, it used mm. to be, it used to be above the like the, um, just above G. You know that okay. would be where I'd start to get a little like, bit of trouble. Like but then, but yeah, but a, then with the yeah. crazy, and then you know that A flat, I used to struggle with a little bit. Um, and then that was kind of it was inconsistent. Like that would be sometimes there and sometimes not there. But then now comfortably and comfortably an a every day of the week um, beautiful and then beautiful. and then and, but then i was surprising myself in school of rock you're floating up to those b's in stick to man yeah um yeah, that's just b and a b and a b and a um um and then even in um there's that the you're in the band reprise which floats mm -hmm. up to a c uh 
And you Sherry C. Don't make it hot. He says, fuck. But then I've always had the crazy falsetto as well. So like the, the my first job overseas was singing the Frankie part in a in a Jersey Boys tribute. Um and so the Jersey that's tones, always been there. Right. Yeah, that's always been that's always been there. It's just I've built my the 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 top part of my chest voice has moved um upwards as well which is it makes sense beautiful. as your as your voice as your voice matures and you know it becomes you become a lot more employable because those a, right. those a's and g's and those b's they're, they're the money makers for those for the are the money makers <laughs> those are yeah. like that in in um in santa in santa fe from newsies i ain't got nothing if i ain't got santa fe if you can sing that you're golden. Yeah, you're exactly. Yeah, silence so. is not golden. Those bees are golden. Silence. <laughs> very good. Very good. Oh, okay. Quit quiz. I, we'd like to get. We'd like to give you a little pop pop quiz. Already. Okay. Uh, already. Okay. Already. Pop quiz. Where does silence is golden play in Jersey Boys? In the underscore. Oh, I do know. I was working this scene the other in the is it the bar between Lorraine and Frankie. Mm -hmm. And, and what other Candy. song is playing uh, in, in that same scene? Dawn. This guy, you got, all right. guy, this guy's good. He's good. We like we like the under, this guy. The, the, the underscore is the transition is so beautiful. Like, <laughs> Yeah, once, and then once, once Nick girls, comes back candy in, girl, this candy girl is in the diner. Yeah. Candy girl underscores, yeah, underscores the scene between Bobby and Frankie, which is just again such a one of my favorite songs. I just think it's absolutely Beautiful. stunning. Just, I wish, I wish I'm it was so, in there. Yeah. I wish we got to perform it. I wish. I yeah, you so, so How did you get to know the catalog of Frankie Valley in the four seasons? I think I just again I saw the show for the first time, and then you know you just become. Ben. And again, I think a lot of the extensive repertoire was by necessity of it became it was my first job overseas. And, you know, I, mm -hmm. I really tested myself. I hadn't really tested my falsetto before that job. But I, you know, I was up for the, the, the show. And I was, I put in a request, I said, I'd like to sing the Frankie part, because I knew with that would come the leadership of the group, which is what I wanted, which is what I, I wanted to kind of be, you know, you want to be on front. And I also, yeah. Did you? I'm sorry. Well, did, did you audition wanting to be Frankie first? I auditioned wanting to do. So I, I wrote myself a list. It was New Year's mm -hmm. Eve of 2016, heading into 2017. And I was, I did a show in Mackay, which is about an hour's flight north of Brisbane. But I spent New Year's in my apartment by myself. I decided to write myself a list of goals and the top of my list was work overseas. So I was looking for every job that was overseas, um, knowing that I was coming straight out of uni, didn't have a lot of credits to my name. So I, I found this job that was working in Europe, doing like hotels, resorts, festivals, pubs, clubs, things like that, doing four seasons. And I was a fan of the four seasons. So I applied for the job wasn't specifying a particular role within that because obviously with a tribute it wasn't it's you know it's vocal parts it's not um not you're not like frankie tommy pub you know right obviously like they called them you know so i was i was on what they called the falsetto part but you know there was a few interesting experiences through that contract where you know you'd lose a guy because of sickness or something like that so i would be seeing the low low parts of blue moon mm -hmm. and the high like so you just so it but that that I can tell you with all honesty, well, that was where my passaggio moved. Wow. Because that was that was that was an eight-month contract. We did 200 shows. And like, like you're working like a lot and your voice just because you forget you get out of your head. You're just doing it and you forget that, oh, I'm hitting these notes. It doesn't matter. You're just singing. And then all That's... of a sudden you go to test you test your range and you're like, oh wow, yeah, my range has gotten a lot bigger. I think that's so, once you can get out of your head, that's, that's the hat trick, right? It's yeah. everything. It's everything. <laughs> yeah. When everything drops away and otherwise it's, it's fine. It's finding out the note. Yeah. Finding out the note you sing after you've sung it is, right. is the magic. Like the first time I hit a C, the first time I hit a C was in a vocal rehearsal for, for um, School of Rock. It was an optional C. You don't have to do it. 
but I hit it. And then the, the vocal director went, you just hit a C. I went, and it was nine in the morning. <laughs> like, like, like I was pretty, I'd, I'd gotten up early and, and I'd warmed up, but it proved to me that it's not how many hours you warm up. It's just getting out of your head. Like, and, you know, obviously correct placement and everything like that. But, you know, I wouldn't, if I didn't know we were aiming for a C, I wouldn't hit it. But because I just let it, mm-hmm. it was like, wow, okay, you just hit a C. And I'm like, okay, I'm good now. I don't need to do it anymore. <laughs> just was, like, was, okay, good. was that a chested C or a mixed? It was a, it was a chest. It was a chest. It was, it, it, was, it was a short <laughs> chest. That, you know, it was just flicked up to it, but it was, yeah, but it was, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, to bring the show back home, what made you want to do um, Jersey Boys? Like, you know, while the, everything was crazy with the pandemic, like, why was that like a, a key show for you to do for next year? And what was the process of getting the rights to the show? Because that's something that we're very interested in um, worldwide. So uh, the 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 story of this current Jersey Boys is is very interesting. So I'll take you back a year if you yeah. indulge me. Um, so I was, I, as I said, I was, I was sitting very much like I am now at a desk in, in London. Um, and I was unemployed, um, as you know, I was, I was, I was working on little projects, but not none that were putting money in my pocket, shall we say. Um, and I was, London had just announced that we were going to go back into lockdown. It was, it was Halloween. And I was just thinking, I need to get back to Australia. But, you know, I knew how much it was going to cost me to get back to Australia. It was going to cost, it ended up costing, I think, well over $5,000 for flights and, you know, <gasps> you know wow. plus, you know, three th- plus 3000 for quarantine and things like that. So it's a, it was an expensive exercise, nearly wiped my bank account out. But mm-hmm. I didn't want to come back to Australia and just go and work in an office. Now, this is me being a bit stubborn, I suppose. I just, I needed to... I'd, I'd worked for so many years to build up this career for myself that I didn't want to just throw it away. So I, it was very important. And I was getting pressure from certain people that, you know, oh, you just come back and just get a job. And, you know, I didn't want to do that. So I, I made some calls. As I said, I, I was connected with a local theatre company um, who, you know, have always been there for me. So I, they, I called them and asked about doing some teaching work. Um, so I asked, I said, look, I'd, I'd love to come back and be an acting tutor for you guys. Um, if you've got a place for me in the same breath, they were looking for a director for Jersey boys, which was coming to their, uh, my hometown theater, which is a beautiful you know, 500 seat theater in Raycliffe. Um, and they were looking for a director for that, which was in March of next year. So I immediately, obviously with my history with the music, I said, yep, I mean, I'm your man. And I didn't even question how much it was they were going to pay me. Like, I was just <laughs> like, I needed something to come back to. And that was, that was it. And it was just like, you know, the stars were in alignment. There you go. Oh. Um, so, um, so I, I set out from London to put out the audition brief and get that set, but also to, to put myself a team together. Uh, my choreographer now, Jenny, had come back from Melbourne uh, after many years of working and living there. And I was a guy that was auditioning who ended up playing Nick in that first production called Jeremy. And his father is a, had been an, a musical director all over the world. Um, and he, he'd been a conductor and a producer. And he, he, his background was in conferences and, and big like hotel expos and things like that overseas. So he was back in Australia because of COVID as well. So Jeremy had reached out to me um, asking some questions about the audition. And he said, by the way, who's your musical director? And I said, I'm still looking because I was obviously still in Australia. So I wasn't able to do these meetings. So he went, all my dad's won. And he said, he'd love to help you out. Um, he, you know, he's looking for something to do um, as a project until he can get back overseas. So it was two in the morning in London. Uh, Robert called me and we struck up a, a, you know, a kinship and we, we agreed on philosophical things regarding music and, and things like that. Some and, ancillary you know, rights. I, I put him forward. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. And <laughs> I put him forward for the project. And he actually, for that, you know, being a professional musical director, he actually volunteered his time for that first production. And 
now he is the executive producer and musical director of this new professional production. So there's so many things that had I not done, you know, there was a couple of people that had said no to being musical directors. Had they said, yes, I'm not taking this little show to the casino um, mm-hmm. now. So, you know, the, 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 the show in Redcliffe was so full of, of professionals and semi-pros because of, again, as because of COVID and, and people were looking for a, a way to get back on stage after a year of um, inactivity that, you know, it was so above the standard of what was, I think, expected in this area. And as a result, you know, we, we took, we got the attention of the casino and of some back, some financial backers and some people that went, you know what? let's really put some money into this. Let's read Let's redesign it. Let's take it up a level. Let's pay all the cast. Let's pay all the band. Let's, let's get everyone. Let's, let's create 40 jobs or, or, or more. Yeah. And so what started as this little project that I thought was going to end for me in March has now turned into a full-time job. And um, it, it just goes to show that, you know, no matter what project you're working, on if it's a if it's a small if you perceive it as a little small project or put everything into it because you don't know who's watching and exactly you know, yeah this will create this will and has created created not only this work for me now which is 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 you know satisfying me so creatively but also financially supporting me but also it's going to create a lot of work down the line and then you know to work work in the beautiful star casino which is it's a perfect show for the casino and you know it's just i couldn't have imagined a year ago it's funny actually and and this is the best bit and this kind of sums up this whole journey a year ago on the uh, i got back the beginning of december i was i was at a place called crown plaza which is a big hotel complex that was where i did my my hotel quarantine which was a, a government mandated thing out my window i could see the star casino and I didn't Aww. know at the time I was looking at the future. I did not know at the time I was looking at the future of Jersey Boys, which is amazing. That's beautiful. Yes. That's... So, so you were in Planet Twando, as Ron Belrose <laughs> likes to call it. <laughs> you really were. You so, were in the right. middle of, of, of the past, present, and the future. So that's beautiful. It's a sign, Tommy. Exactly. So well, thank you for, so for sharing that, that timeline with us. So now that the show has turned into a full-time job for you, um, we were watching yeah. your talk with Christian Hoff. Um, did you mention in there that you talked to Des Maganoff and he kind of gave you point? I, on I haven't. Doing? Obviously, obviously Christian yeah. has extensively. So right. I mean, for me, I'm getting I'm getting the information secondhand. I'd love to, of course, of course. but um, no, I, I haven't. Um, I don't, mm. You know, I'm always open to, to any conversations. I'll talk. To, I'll talk to anybody. <laughs> well, so so when it comes to directing this new production and really you know just being at the forefront of it all um are there any changes um that you've made creatively to, like, from the Dodgers production and can you talk about any of them without giving too much away absolutely uh, um I'm happily to talk about it. yeah it's a complete redesign um it's the imagination of the show it follows the, the same amazing script the script, same amazing songs but um everything from the tracks in terms of the cast and and the roles they play so for example you know our tracks don't follow the the classic format that is on broadway we've completely we rebuild the tracks according to the person playing it um which which allows for one ownership of, of one's track but also you get the absolute best out of each person because you're not shoehorning a person's skill set into a particular track we've built the track to the person so nice. obviously creates a lot more work onto me, but it also has, has has yielded incredible results because that person has is the first person to play that particular track. Um, same deal with the, the design. We play in a, a trapezoid. Our, our, our play. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. If you're looking from the front, in fact, you know what? Wait there. I might have a drawing <gasps> for you. Please. Hey. That Just wait. Great. Just wait. Exclusive. Let's I haven't released win. these to anybody. Exclusive. Thank you. Hey, <laughs> this is it, guys. You're getting an exclusive. Here we go. Right here, right now. So let's give you guess. That's exactly. that's what we do. We get the exclusives. Oh, uh, waiter, one more set design photo, please. Ooh, a trapezoid. 
Cool. Well, I love the fact that they fitted. Um, well, that they changed. Like they casted the tracks depending on yeah on the actor. That's really cool. So for, so maybe you know if um and I'm also, so right now Austin Owen as Bob Crew plays the judge. Right. Maybe the actor who plays Jip is going to be the judge. Right. Instead, you know. Yeah. Can, like can you? Can, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah. So this is uh this is a an early concept drawing of the I don't know Ooh. if you can see it. It's light. Oh, that's sick. kind of triangular in their shape. So they look, so that's one of our set structures there. So you can see oh, it, wow. it's very, so the main entrance is through the doorway underneath the, the top platform. Right there. So oh, okay. it's very um, in, industrial, much the same, but it's, it's, they look triangular. And the reason being is that, and they snake from off stage to on stage. So it's very, it never stops moving. There's always, and it's people coming from all different directions. And I think just by simply having a different playing space, you show your actors that this is their production of Jersey Boys. And, you know, they are not bound to any rules previously. They can do with it what they will and they can completely create because we've created a, a world that looks different for them. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a lot more stripped back in terms of, you know, we've really gone for that somewhere between the original and somewhere between the Eastwood, Clint Eastwood film. It's very mm -hmm. filmic. Um, you know, we've been incredibly detailed with our props and with our, uh, our co costuming and, you know, going and looking at reference materials of the original scene. What did they wear? Um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, the classic, you know, so uh, spoiler alert, there will be no cherry red jackets in our production. Um, we go for really? the burgundy velvet. We go for the burgundy velvet yeah. because okay. that's what they wore. They actually they actually wore those. Right. Yeah. Um, at the so, at the North Shore Music Theater in the United States, they also did loot right. for Sherry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, just just things like that. To you know, I'm I'm a bit controversial in the way that I kind of I fight against audience expectations. So I I did a production of Wizard of Oz years ago and. Dorothy didn't wear a blue gingham dress <gasps> um, because, you know, because it means pressure on the actress to be Judy Garland. I want, you want to give your actors the best to be their own version of a character and, you know, for them to truly create. Now, obviously, if they're stepping into an existing production, you know, like the Dodger production, completely different story. But... For this one, we had the opportunity to completely um, to redesign and, and from the set, you know, those were the early drawings. I've seen the set being built. It's just spectacular and, and you know, it's, it's going to be um, amazing. And, and those crossbars above the top, every time a sign flies in, it looks, it has a point of connection. So it looks like, like our bowling alley sign, for example, I'm not sure the dimensions of the original, but our bowling alley sign is 5.6 meters by 3.6 meters. So the size of a wall pretty much is huge. Mm -hmm. so wow. it's, 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 you know, there's some giant pieces that we've got in the show um, that, you know, just, you know, and really, the conventional and conventional looks as well. So we don't have any lead lead elements, no no lead um, um, no lead screens. Um, okay. All of our lights are conventional lights, lighting fixtures. We have a we we have a two rigs in terms of our lighting. So we have a false rig which is flown <laughs> into view of the audience. Which right. so if you can imagine from the front, you'll have trussing that will fly and it'll fly on an angle like that. So you'll see trussing that'll give it that, that'll tie together nicely with the, the set. And on those trusses will be, you know, old school conventional park hands, those big silver fixtures. So we'll get a lot of great light from those and that'll that'll tie together this era appropriate, you know, show that, or this look that we're going for. But then above that, you'll have another rip with your moving lights and, and, and the rest. So things like that will just help us create this historically accurate world. I, ha I have a question. So when, because mm -hmm. I, I know we, we, we wanted, we, we'd love to know how you, you know, how you secured the rights for the show and everything, you know, for this, you know, for the second time around. I, I remember the name of the, the, the rights company that, in Australia works with theatrical rights worldwide but so when you obviously you know when when they brought the show 
to other countries, English speaking countries, they changed some things in the script, you know, Rick Ellis and Marshall Brickman, they, they made changes because a lot of these, you know, uh, like foreign audiences, yeah, yeah. They, they don't understand the, the, the New Jersey centric specific lines. Yeah. So in the, in the script that you get, do you, do they give you the original script and then alternate lines because you're in, you're in a foreign country or do you get just the original script? So I guess what we want to know yeah. is the, 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 your, your, your experience with the rights and the licensing companies and that specific question about the script. Yeah. So, uh, Origin Theatrical is the company that Origin handles Theatrical. our rights in okay. association with theatrical rights worldwide, obviously. Um, so you generally speaking, uh, and again, this is a more of a producer problem than mine, but, um, you know, generally speaking, there's, I think it's, it's much the same with music as it is with, um, with, with anything you, you have a, uh, you have a percentage that you can change if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I know exactly the two the two parts you're speaking about the and they're both Tommies, they're both, they're both Tommy, and, they're, and they're in the early you know the and and the London production uses those you know yeah Jersey's great um, got some, got some of the finest prisons, prisons, in, prisons in the country right. yeah. and that's because obviously in England we call a turnpike for you guys is a roundabout right a turnpike is a kind of highway actually okay. Yeah. So yes. Um. So those those lines are are things that we're we're allowed to change. Um. You know because I believe the the original. I've, I've see the funny thing is I'm I'm Australian but I haven't seen the original Australian production. Um. Because oh, I saw, okay. saw it in, right. um in in the US. So I haven't seen that Australian production, but I can assume it would follow the same rules as the as the original. In terms of what's written in our scripts, it's the same script that you guys would get over in the u.s it's it's then they're not changed those lines um but you know you're constantly in discussion with the rights holders so anytime you're unsure about something you just ask the question and most of the time they'll come back and they'll give you a pretty you know they on they i mean they have a they have a list of rules and, and all of that so um you know they're more than willing to help you and i think even more post covid they're, they're more than willing to work with you and, and have those conversations yeah, so so does that percentage include changes in the set and the lighting and even the choreography? No, that that is kind of a that's a blank canvas for us, you know. Okay. As, you know, as long as you don't tamper with the integrity. Like if I took out Sherry, for example, not only would the audience <laughs> want to want to destroy me, but you know right. that that becomes a big issue. But in terms of the redesign and the reinterpretation and the rebuilding of the of the characters and the way we cast it. That's mm -hmm. completely at our discretion. So our cast is fifteen on stage, one off. Okay. Um, so we've got, you know, so so it's it's a little bit different um, in terms of obviously it's, a, it's written and performed traditionally by twelve. Mm -hmm. um, so, but we've also got an extra musician. So we have eleven in our band as opposed to ten. So because we have a conductor mm -hmm. who also adds additional percussion. So we've actually oh. got an extra, we've got. We've got an extra element of depth in terms of music as well, which is really cool. So you know, so is it, the conductor it, playing the keyboard and additional per? So he's not. No, so he's not. He's so just he's, a conductor. He's like stick, but also playing some percussion. That's correct. Wow. So yeah, it's it's very cool because our our musical director is you know his background is as a concert percussionist. Like he played percussion for Sinatra and for Whitney Houston and. Whoa. For, you know some and you know you know some big heavy hitters so you know to add those like for, for example and and it's it's so funny because obviously the orchestrations are so lush and rich as it is but you know there's a couple of songs that like you know like oh what a night is springing out at me and same way can't take my eyes off of you the the there's bongos behind it in the you know and and, and it's just like it just adds this just a, a, just an extra layer of depth it's so subtle but it it just it you know again it helps create ownership of our mm -hmm. production and, can i um, ask a specific cool. orchestration question that you might know the answer to mm -hmm. so um you said the conductor is adding percussion yes. so this is a, such a niche question um the, the 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 timpani hits right before 
right before Ragdoll. When are we going to have a real temp? Is that yeah. what you're going to ask? Yeah. We are going to have a real temp. That's sick. Cool. Same with Began. Oh, right. <laughs> so definitely this, the, the original production that I did was, was that keyboard patch with the, with the temps, which sounded fine. Sure. But which sounds time, fine. You know, yeah. Live temp. Live, live temp. You see, that, that's, that's the kind of niche we're going for. Is it going to be a live symphony or not? <laughs> I wish, I really wish we can come see this. Like, oh, I would yeah. sick. Well, if you're recording it, please send us something. Well, we'll... who knows? We may have a life beyond 2022. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Hey, wow. That, that okay. Just, well, fingers sick. crossed. Knock on wood. That'd be great. If, if you do, we'll definitely be there. My hand to God. Yes. <laughs> um, so a question about how you are portraying Tommy this time and with your brand new cast. Mm -hmm. um, so your bio says that you have a very youthful energy to you, which of course we can definitely tell yeah, through this phone time, call. Um, now, when it comes to the portrayal of Tommy, in all honesty, I think I would rather have an underdeveloped Frankie than an underdeveloped Tommy. Because like you, you need that right off the bat. And because that tone... You just you need it throughout the entire show and there's um, a spectrum of the kind of tommy you can play you know right so usually so it can either be like that that youthful tommy or more of that that mob boss that more toxic like like upfront toxic tommy um so yeah. what do you plan on bringing to the role this time it's it's very interesting hey and i know I, I really do and i know i'm biased because i'm playing the guy but i think tommy is one of the well most well-written characters in theater I think he's mm -hmm. just incredible and I love I love characters on stage that portray our basic humanity good and bad and Tommy has moments of good and he has a lot of moments of of bad as well I think that the the common mistake for for an actor stepping in to Tommy would be to play him as the bad guy he's not he he's a guy that does bad things but if you play him as a bad guy, you're not going to care about anything that happens within the show. So the first thing that I, 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 I attempt to, to really sort out is the relationships that I have with the, the three other guys, particularly Frankie. If the audience don't believe that I love this boy, and, and he is like a brother to me and that I will protect him, you know, especially in that first 43 pages. That's, that's where my entire show as Tommy hinges on. The, the success of me in Act 2 completely hinges on that first 43 pages and making the audience buy into the relationship that I have with Frankie and the, the kinship that we have. So, you know, I have to convince the audience that I love this guy. And it helps because I'm such a big fan of Bryn and, and Bryn and I are, you know, we really do get along in that way and we trust each other. And I think that does help. And, you know, same with setting up that dynamic between myself and Nick. Nick truly does have to live under my thumb for the entire first act. Otherwise, mm -hmm. his eventual tirade doesn't mean anything. Same with Bob. So I have to set up that. I have to set up a, a position as the leader of the group and really, so be dominant in a way that you know, dominant by necessity. I keep going back to that word. Necessity Ooh, is the fact okay. that he was what the group needed him to be, which was that, well, that lead from the chest and do what needs to be done. But you do occasionally see moments where he kind of drops it a little bit, and it's usually behind people's back when no one's watching. Um, so I think setting up that power struggle between Tommy and Bob is really interesting and, and having, you know, Bob eventually, you know, there's this subtle little moments, um, you know, the first time that Bobby steps in front of Tommy to say, I'll tell you what the problem is. That's a, that's a defining moment because that's the first time Bobby takes leadership and Tommy doesn't like it. Exactly. And then you set, you know, the whole thing about the, the, the session, the money, Here's your money. Well, nobody has to ask. Well, you know, that's that whole dynamic. And then eventually we get to scene eight. All of these little steps are so important in earning the, the scene eight. In that's, that's, if we don't set up all of those steps first, scene eight is, is just playing with straight anger and it means nothing, you know. 
I think by Act Two, Scene Eight, straight off the bag, and the weight on the all four different weights, you know, but you no, know, there's there's an exhaustion there, and I think playing the sense of for me at the end of um, this is a and again this is letting a little bit behind the curtain of what we're doing in this production stay for us the first version the first stay where you know frankie says the loans the taxes we take it all that that scene is started from tommy's in his chair there. he's above him, standing over him saying the loans the taxes we take it all looking directly at tommy so that we completely change the power dynamic whereas in act one and early in act two tommy stands over frankie now here's frankie and there's no choreography in in stay for the very reason that that whole first stay is just watching Tommy go and mm -hmm. the whole the idea of stay like can we not just stay in this moment remembering the better times that used to happen and things like mm -hmm. that and, and you're watching him go it for me as much as I'm hurt in that moment and kind of you know I'm pissed at Bob and I'm disappointed in Nick I play that the loans the taxes we take it all my job here is done. Frankie's taken the lead. I'm proud of him in a sick way. There's like this mm -hmm. sick pride that, that <laughs> like I stand up and I'm like, you know, so you're all grown up. Well yeah. done, kid. You don't need, you don't need me anymore. You know, mm -hmm. I held it all together till we hit. And then I think Tommy in a way thinks my job here is done. You know, he was what the group needed, not necessarily what people wanted him to wanted. be. And that's, that's how I'm, right. that's how I'm playing it. I play this, I definitely, you know, he does some dastardly things. You know, he hits on the rain, and I'm I'm not backward and cover forwards. I, I really lay into that scene, and he mm. is in a show without the the typical antagonist. He is the most human and the most flawed of all four. But I think the way we play it is that all four of these guys are flawed. Tommy's just a little bit more. Um, it's just a little bit clearer that Tommy is is flawed. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's, it's interesting playing it as the director of the show as well. And I think it is the perfect role to direct from because he was in essence, the director of the group for that, for that right. first chunk. So here I am moving guys and telling them, okay, you move over here. We're going to go here and here and here. And then in the show as Tommy, I'm doing the exact same thing. Um, and it's, it's fantastic. And it really does help set that precedent of, Frankie's the lead singer, but Tommy's in charge. And that's that's kind of, how, you know, it's, it's very fast, fascinating. Gia said the most brilliant thing a few weeks ago. We love the show because it's about four anti-heroes. Yeah, in a way. Exactly. Yeah. It is. Four anti-heroes who are flawed. Yeah. No, and, and Tom, thank you so much for giving us that that sneak peek into how you're doing stay. And and you really are. I, I'm just so thankful that, you know, that you are so in tune with with the show and which and with each with the message and yeah and 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 with tommy specifically i i will admit i i never caught this until i finally saw the show again in person this year in november i think the most telling scene for tommy it really seeing like that that dominance by necessity as you said which i love um is when he he gets he comes back like, with the money and then bob Cruz says no i got it you know, it's fine. Like my dad likes me. And then like when in that moment in his eyes, you can see him totally torn. And and <laughs> and we've seen performances of Tommy either just go freaking crazy or you see him start to break. Yeah. And you know, so and Nick always says that the beginning of the end was after was you know, was was way was, was way, way after way, that. Way, no, was was well, I mean way before was oh I mean after well, that. Yeah. But before but, but, before, but I, I think solid. I think that is the beginning of the end for Tommy. And that Tommy, so in I, some I, ways, I'm so curious how you'll play that part when he goes back and talks to everybody. With it, it's I play it as you know, straight up fire in the you know, nobody has to ask, the group needs money, I take care I of it. it, and then and then there's a moment, yeah, and then that's the hurt that you know what, fine, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, my money. That, I got other things, yeah, it hinges on the reaction of everyone who's sitting in Bob Cruz's living room is like, that's definitely a, a, a defining moment for Tommy too. Like mm -hmm. it hinges on that reaction. And then he knows he's at the, you know, in scene eight, he, right before he gets carted off, he knows he's at the end. 
right right before Frankie asks him about you know what else. He's like, how many more hits do you think you're gonna write? I'm gonna, I'm, if I'm going down, you're going down with me. Mm-hmm. That's such. I, 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 the first time I really heard that line, I was like, wow, this guy's a. <laughs> at, at this moment in time, he's a real shit bag. Yeah, I, it's it's yeah. fascinating. You know, we, the first time I played it, and I and I haven't decided yet if I want to go down this road again. If it's a little bit too, on the nose, but we played Skay as a, you know in that first bit of music before the the, the vocals kicking because there's a, there's a little bit of music before the thing starts tommy would stand you know as i said with that same intention of mm-hmm. you know respect frankie i'm proud of you and i, I he put his hand out for a handshake to say thank you and 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 frankie would just unable to accept it at that time would 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 walk past him and just kind of like you know no not now and then we played it as at the in the the rock and roll hall of fame when he says sorry about your daughter frankie he puts the hand out again and it's finally accepted so oh. i don't know whether we'll go down that road again um but you know that's certainly the whether the handshake is there or not that's certainly the intention is that you know everything's broken and then that sorry about your daughter is the is the olive branch if you will and you know that's when we and and I think as well when I come back in for the Hall of Fame, Tommy is a is a he's a not a healed man, but he's he's still Tommy and he's still got that bravado. But I try to bring in a little bit of excitement as well, you know, you know, you know all that other shit. The Oscars, the Emmys, you can get that anywhere, but you can't buy this. You know, I turn to back to to the stage, and you know, I I let that I let that. There's very few moments in the show where Tommy is actually genuinely excited about something, and I play that moment with pure you know, passion and excitement and, you know, this is cool. And, and right. it's, it's a really nice moment for Tommy because he still has to be endearing to the audience and he still has to be likable. He's the first one you meet. So you have to give the audience moments where he's a bit charming and, and likable. So that, that's a moment, especially coming right before his final monologue, is, which is after all the bad shit he's done. Um, so that that's really important to me to, to just sprinkle a few of those really um approachable and, and nice moments in there so that you know the audience isn't completely turned off by him everyone remembers it how how they need to right exactly <laughs> and that sums up the that sums up the entire show that's he, he sums up the entire show in that that's, line you know yeah and well, well um, I, I love and, that's such an interesting and I love perspective that because it's without, very much I mean, like go ahead yeah it's it's interesting because it's just like Tommy's just like he he says that everybody remembers it how they need to, right? It's almost like admitting to the audience. He's like, Yeah, we've all told you our truth, but maybe none of them are actually true. You know, and it's like a little wink mm-hmm. at the end layer. It's, it's the most Tommy thing to say. It's like, yeah, you know what I told you? Maybe it's not true. And then he just kind of struts off, and that's that's you know, it's brilliant. Peace. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> and it takes him a lot for him just to yeah. do that. Right. It's a big admission. Exactly. And I I love your perspective and the idea of of a second handshake. I think that's definitely interesting. Please let us know if you decide to go with it and if it works. I will. I will. I'm I'm tossing up with it. And again, it's such a, these are the small moments that, again, there's no dialogue, there's nothing, but it just, they they change Mm -hmm. everything. And, um, you know, something like that. There are so many moments that are paid off later um mm-hmm. you know the towel thing is paid off later you know there's, right. there's so many of those those moments <laughs> the callback, that yeah. are, are the, paid the off book yeah, ending the, 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 the call as ron, ron melrose likes to call it the book yeah. ending yeah <laughs> yeah so there are there are again I, I think there needs to be peace at the end and um you know it's you know for me to succeed as tommy um i need to love the guys that i'm working with and i do so Good. Well, we're so glad. And well, so it's interesting because a lot of what we're talking about is what's what's in the abstract and what is interpreted over time in the show. So, you know, when let's say, for example, in that scene, when Tommy says, you know, if, so if we need the money, I take care of it. Once that scene is over, you know, that's when we think like, well, so what, what does Tommy do with that money? You know, is that when he starts getting the apartments to put his girlfriends in, you know, all all those little things. And um, so to, to further that kind of interpretation and that thought, we actually started creating candles that we're selling as part of our merchandise mm. um, with Gianni Costanzo. Plug, he's, he's our guy who does everything Stage for Stage Life us. Candle Co. Yes. Um, and so our, for our winter candle, we created 
one that's called Tommy's Party. And this was Dion's idea. And of course, it, 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 for people who want it just to be a light Christmas thing, it's oh, what a night, enjoy. Maybe they Bob have, gets laid, great. Maybe, and maybe um, they have a friend named Tommy. They're going to the party. Right, exactly. Everyone has a friend named Tommy. And we, have, we have a new one right now. Exactly. And, <laughs> um, but also with, um, but we, it really is kind of talking about that that bittersweet, you know, kind of sad Christmas time, um, you know, when it's after the Hall of Fame induction, Tommy has his party, Frankie doesn't go. You know, I, I couldn't I couldn't walk in you know, I couldn't go in yeah. um so what do you think is happening at that party you know in, in that meantime like have, have you thought about that at all and does Tommy miss Frankie does he forget about Frankie just give him the invitation and then yeah. not even think about him after mm -hmm. oh that's a really tough question hey I think it's I mean it, it's the Italian American side of things I think it's gonna be it's a big party it's a big soiree there's gonna be a lot of people there I think Tommy's a great no seller. He will he will be aware that Frankie isn't there, and he'll be hurt by it because you know I think they're deeply emotional people. But he wouldn't sell it. He wouldn't he wouldn't react to it. He wouldn't make a big deal. You know, he kind of toss it off. And then I think as Tommy does, he will have those moments later where you know. Mm -hmm. But I think there's music. I think there's lots of food, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's got to be a nice um, 12 year age whiskey for, for Nick. You've got to have it. Of course. Um, <laughs> um, um, I don't know what the original Tommy was a drink, what, what he liked to drink. Um, I could imagine it would be in that whiskey or bourbon elk. Um, if it was me, it would be a bottle of Grey Goose, a personal. Okay. Nice. Nice. Uh, you've got to get it. You just avoid over if you drink good stuff. Um, but you know, so yeah, no, I think it's, it's, I, it's certainly one of those things where it's crowded enough that most people might not notice, but I think Tommy would, Tommy's a lot more aware and a lot, a lot less ignorant than I think people probably realize, but it just think again, by necessity, you just kind of shrug things off or you don't sell them because that's kind of what you have to do. Um, you don't let people know you're hurt or you're scared or you're, you know, whatever you just be what people expect of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's so interesting, you know, see, seeing all these, these stories um, from back then today because they were all about expressing everything up. For, like the second it happens, you know, we're very much in that that kind of culture now. Um, but I think there there is we we still do those things internally. Um, but it's great for us to see what it was like back then and to and to kind of see the what happens when like what are the repercussions when we do that to ourselves? The strong and silent type. You know, exactly. Certainly. Yeah, Freddie Gary, Gary Cooper. And, yeah, <laughs> and and I think as well as there's an important PSA in there as well as that. Yeah. that being that person can be very damaging to those around you. You know, exactly. Tommy's story, at least in the you know the the 1960s, didn't end well because mm -hmm. he was he you know maybe he if he talked more maybe if he you know communicated maybe if he reached out a lot of his issues could have been avoided, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, that is an important PSA and, and you know, to, to play the, to, to, you know, really show the damages and not glorify it. I think I, I try not to glorify that stuff, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the gambling and stuff like that, you know, I'm, I'm aware that I'm performing it in a casino, casino. But like, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't, you don't want to make that seem that there does have to be a tinge of regret there. You can't just be like, yeah, well, whatever, you know, it's just what I did. And, you know, I think right. you it's really... not aspirational. In a exactly. way. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, it's so interesting that you bring that up because um, well, I'm not sure if you've watched the new Sex in the City reboot and just like that. I haven't, I haven't gotten to it yet. Okay. So no, no spoilers at all. Um, but I was reading about Michael Patrick <laughs> King and, and yeah. Um, so just don't do me a favor. Do not go on the Peloton Instagram. Just don't do it. Um, that's where the spoiler is. Um, but anyway, so I was reading articles um, with Michael Patrick King, you know, the director and, and the creator of the show. Um, and people were wondering, you know, about, about, about the girls, you know, it's like, are they still going to be like super rich, you know, cause like, it's like, well, that's, that's not realistic. That's not something that, that, you know, American girls should really be um, like looking up to. And he's like, look, they're still the same. And in all honesty, that was a huge part of why the show is so attractive and popular is because it is aspirational. And they say, you know, if it was Absolutely. aspirational, then it's still, it still is. 
And I think that's really, that's really great. And I, it's, it's kind of the same thing. And you have offerings exactly. that are not that as well. You know, for every making a murderer, there needs to be care bears. Right, um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> be, you know, you, you just need to have the balance. You know, we need to see mm. the, 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 the two extremes. And I think that's, that, that taking it back to Tommy is that's one thing I try to bring. I try to bring the extremes, yeah. the, the extreme love. It's, it's, it's red, right? red colors throughout the whole show but red is love as much as it is hate and i think there needs yeah, to be ooh. you need to see both in, in order for the whole thing to work i agree for every yes. tommy devito you need a handsome hank yep it, and and our handsome hank is just wow we, we, we play we play hank as like a pre-hippie like almost like he's, <laughs> oh. he's not he's on the cutting edge like he would be, he would be one of the guys that eventually becomes a hippie so that's you know, a great answer, he's yeah. one of them that and levitates the Pentagon. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty much. Yeah, no, he's like a little bit like yeah. Wow. Okay, some... what, a, wow. what a what a call. To, <laughs> that that's a great idea, Tom. The same with the same with Bob Crew. Like we've we've got him on in every scene we see him, he's probably two years ahead in terms of the fashion he wears. So like when we see him in I love that after let's hang on into Opus, he's like in a safari suit. You know, we see him <laughs> like, you know, we see it. You know, so like that's amazing. Kind of ahead, ahead, ahead of the curve in terms of you know what, wow. what he'd be wearing, or you know, uh, he would. Ahead yeah. of your time. Did you ever do Justin to make? There we go. Mate, yeah. It was my my first lead role in a music oh, musical. Was nice. was um, Joseph? That was the second yeah. musical I ever did. First time was... girls ever actually looked at me. Oh, <laughs> hey, listen. Joseph is a sexy role, yes. especially when uh, when when you when you got when you go shirtless it, it is. and close every door. Come on, I mean the, the, the close every door. You get your spray tan on. You shirtless. Get your... <laughs> I haven't I seen sh- it. I don't you know. Were, oh, I was sh- I I was shirtless up until um, grovel grovel. I was shirtless like the whole show. Really? Well, so it's, yeah. it's it's from 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 when they throw you in jail. Until after Pot- uh, well, no, from Potiphar because Potiphar is where you get stripped off until right after Stone the Crows. That's true, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're you're wearing that Pharaoh's outfit that that goes over your bare skin, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Oh yeah. my God, that was that was the that was the second musical I ever did way back when I was fifth fifth grade. So how old? Aww, was this? Like 10. 10, 10 years old. That was the second musical I ever did. Yeah. Cute. Oh. I missed my I missed my my high school prom because I was the lead in Joseph. So really? I, um, that's I, I, I decided that, and I was off. Yeah, so that was you know another one of those Troy Bolt moments. Yeah, no soccer game, no prom. You're committed, man. And that's it, man. <laughs> hey, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> I think this is a perfect place to wrap up everyone this has been another episode of silhouettes jb podcast (laughs) all right one division okay (laughs) thank you very much to yes oh my god (laughs) thank thank you very much thomas armstrong robley tommy devito and director of jersey boys at the star casino in australia um, follow him on Instagram. Can you tell everyone your Instagram handle? It is easy at Armstrong Robley, R O B L E Y, all one word, no hyphens, no capitals, no nothing. Just Armstrong That's Robley it. on Instagram. And, or you just look all. just look up my name and I'm the only one. That's the easy thing. Armstrong <laughs> there Robley. There's no other Armstrong Robleys in the world. So it's easy. That's it. And then also look up at Jersey Boys Musical. Mm-hmm. So you can find the official Instagram page of the production of Jersey Boys. Of course, follow us at Silhouettes JB Podcast underscore um, on Facebook, Silhouettes JB Podcast. Find us on YouTube, Anchor. Thank you to Anchor for sponsoring us. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Breaker. Um, all the places you can listen All the places to you can listen to podcasts and, and watch podcasts. <laughs> um, and get and please like and subscribe because like you, know, you have to say that in order for and to work. Get, get your and, tickets for yes. Jersey Boys 
Um, January 6th to the 16th that we are putting the link in our in our bio so you'll definitely be able to see it and and Thomas really thank you so much for your perspective thank you for your balls for for implementing all of your ideas the balls on you man seriously you are giving us something to really talk about and and different things to consider and bringing new life to Jersey Boys I mean really appreciate that and I hope thank you, you guys yes um, so please send thank us you very much